We'll start off with the local squad here with the Washington football team and a tweet from PFF that you commented on. Can Chase Young cement himself as a top five edge rusher in 2021? You're basically saying he could be a superstar in year two for Washington. Yeah, I mean, Chase Young was the best edge rusher prospect that we've ever seen come along at PFS since we've been grading college football. Um, so we started grading college in the, the 2014 season. So we've seen the likes of Miles Garrett, Joey Bosa, Nick Bosa, some of these you know best pass rushers in the NFL. And Chase Young was a better college prospect than those guys and you know we haven't seen anything so far in year one to say that that's wrong and critically our pass rushing grades pff's pass rushing grades at the college level translate really well to the nfl so if you have a superstar at college who's just dominating when it comes to those pass rush grades the, the speed the decisiveness of um, his wins when it comes to each rep those guys translate to the NFL level, or they have done really, really well over the last few years, and, and Young is as good as anybody. So I think when you consider that you know injury derailed his rookie year a little bit, sort of slowed him down a, a touch, and he was still a top-10 graded pass rusher, I mean, this is the year we could really see Chase Young um, take a leap forward and be a, a special player. So he had seven and a half sacks as a rookie, 32 solo tackles, four forced fumbles. Are, are there a few metrics that you guys at Pro Football Focus are looking at for him to really make to make that leap? Well, what can he improve on in year two? What does he need to work on? Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen flashes of it. You know, he was a guy that was getting a lot of pressure early in the season, began his career with two games that had four pressures, a couple of sacks, obviously, in that first game. Um, and then I think injury slowed him down. You know, he got he got that injury, missed a little bit of time, and wasn't quite the same player for a while when he came back. And then over the last sort of six weeks, six, seven weeks of the season, then we got to see Chase Young cooking again. And every single game – for the last uh, six or seven, had multiple pressures, um, had a, a much better grade across the board. So I think if he gets a healthy season, I, I think we'll see that jump. He had 42 total pressures that first year. Um, I think just naturally you'll see that number skyrocket, you know, push well above 60 given the kind of force that he is. You know, Sam, we've been uh, kicking around for the last few days uh, some of these national guys going out on a limb and kind of being high on Washington and being local guys here. We have, we don't we don't feel like we've had a national buzz in quite a long time. Um, but, you know, you had Orlovsky. Uh, he's high on, on Washington. You had Lewis Riddick said that he's, you know, Washington's their, his clear-cut favorite to win the NFC East. A lot of it obviously hinges on the quarterback, right? And they bring in Fitzpatrick, who's much maligned. In my opinion, Sam, he's playing the best football of his career in the latter part of his career. If that continues, I think we're in a great spot. I'm a Washington fan. Jason, though, is more anti-Fitz. He's a down. He's going to have four interception games. What's something interesting, or at least you tweeted something interesting about Fitz. What is your take overall on Ryan's Fit, Ryan Fitzpatrick? Yeah, and I'm actually going to turn that into an article, but I've been away for the last week, so I haven't had a chance to do it yet. Fitzpatrick is um, hes a fascinating player to me because I think you're both right in a way that, look, he, uh, Fitzpatrick's not a superstar. Like, he's mm -hmm. not going to be a top-10 graded quarterback. He's not going to be a, a super, an all-pro. Maybe he'll make the Pro Bowl because the Pro Bowl is that much of a mess. But, you know, he's an average NFL quarterback at this point. But where he started from, that's a hell of an achievement. And particularly to be still kicking, you know, a decade later in that position is amazing. And I think, you know, the one cliche everybody brings out about him is, hell, Ryan Fitzpatrick went to Harvard. Um and I think what that does is it's meant that he's been able to look at his game, um, evaluate himself, and understand how to change the way he plays to make himself a better player late in his career. So he can't fix decision making. You know, he's all, it's a different skill set. So Fitzpatrick is always going to make mistakes. And you're right, he's always going to have those games where he throws a bunch of interceptions and it's a disaster. Um, and there's nothing he can do about that. But what he has been able to do is to look at his game um, and fairly evaluate where he's good, where he's weak, and what is the best way of maximizing that skill set. And I think that's why you're right. Over the last few years, 
they've been the best seasons of his career, late in his career. Um, he's playing the best football we've ever seen from him, and I think it's because he understands that, look, I don't have a rocket for an arm, and I don't have the skills of guys like Patrick Mahomes, but I understand what I'm looking at. I can put the ball in the air and give receivers a chance to make plays, and if I get guys like Terry McLaurin or Devontae Parker or Brandon Marshall, I can make those guys look good by giving them a chance. Other quarterbacks won't. Um, so I think Fitzpatrick has been just this fascinating case study in a quarterback that, you know, it's very difficult. The Wonderlick is supposed to give you an insight into how smart a quarterback is on the basis that that tells you whether they can be Peyton Manning or Tom Brady, you know, between the between the whistles. And it doesn't really. It's a different skill set. But what it does is give you the ability to be a Ryan Fitzpatrick and say, okay, you're going to be able to actually be smart enough to change the way you play the game and and mitigate or put yourself in the best position to succeed. I think we're still a way away from being able to you know, actually zero in on that sort of on-field decision-making skill set. But the other part of it, I think, is is what Ryan Fitzpatrick is really good at. Sam, we just did two segments where we had callers, you know, fans call up and give their prediction for the NFC East this year. Now, we went around the room and gave ours. And, um, I, I'm, you know, based on your – I don't even know if you do this, but based on your preseason grades, how would you predict the NFC East this year? One through four. I think Washington, I think, I think they probably should be the favorites. Um, I think they have the best roster top to bottom. They don't have the best quarterback, which is the, always a concern when you're projecting a division. Usually you just default, go, let's, go with the, <clears throat> let's go with the best quarterback and work from there. I think Dallas has the best quarterback, but they don't have as good a team top to bottom as Washington does. So those, I think, are the two teams that are going to be vying for, for the lead. Uh, Dallas, that offense should be pretty special. It's got a, a group of receivers that are fantastic. It's got a quarterback that was playing the best football of his career before Dak Prescott got got, got injured last season. Um, the offensive line should be good, though I, it might not be special anymore. The times of it being the best offensive line in the NFL are probably gone. The question with Dallas is how good can they make that defense because that was a real issue a year ago. It should improve just by the change in, in coaching staff and um, scheme and those kinds of things, but the defense could be an Achilles heel for Dallas. The Giants, I think, will be better than they were a year ago, but it all comes down to what kind of step Daniel Jones can take at quarterback, and I'm very concerned that their offensive line is just too bad for that offense to be good and for Daniel Jones to be good. And then Philadelphia, I just don't think are good enough to be in the conversation with everybody else. I think it would take a bunch of things breaking their way that we don't anticipate for them to be in the same kind of mix. Joined by Sam Monson, lead NFL analyst from Pro Football Focus. You can give him a follow on Twitter, at PFF underscore Sam. You retweeted the the college arm of PFF, basically saying that a bunch of teams obviously made a mistake in letting Aaron Donald slip to 13 in his draft class. You're saying the same thing may have happened with Philly, who you just touched on, with Devontae Smith at wideout. Because he just you know didn't weigh enough uh, for a lot of people uh, in the scouting uh, department to be willing to risk a top 10 pick on him. Yeah, I just think that the NFL is still very bad at um, overlooking sort of outlier size and weight things. You know, they have this picture that everybody wants a look like, you know, defensive tackle, 300 pounds, wide receivers. You want to see those guys 190 plus, um, whatever the number is. And we're very bad at overlooking when a guy doesn't tick those boxes, even if everything else works. So, you know, when you look at Aaron Donald, it's not like Donald surprised people. The NFL Aaron Donald is the same as the college Aaron Donald. He was already a freak of nature, a guy that was just dominating the competition at that level. We knew this was who he was. The question was, would it translate immediately to the NFL? And if not, why not? And, you know, it's like... It was a story from Seattle's war room when they drafted Russell Wilson. And it was, you know, if Russell Wilson was six foot two, what is his negative? Like, what's the red flag? And nobody had anything. Like, Russell Wilson went in the third round, not the first round, because he was 5'10, 5'11, um, and no other reason. Like, if that is your one sole criticism of a guy, it probably doesn't matter. 
And that's where I am on Devontae Smith. Like, okay, he's 166 pounds, and that is scary. That's like 30 pounds smaller than you expect a guy of those dimensions to be. Um, And particularly when you have a guy like Jamar Chase in the same draft, and it's just, you know, it's easier, right? You can, if you're debating between the two of them, you just go with the guy that's 190 plus, and you don't have to worry about it. Devontae Smith was 166 in Alabama when he was destroying the SEC and putting up, like, ridiculous numbers that won him the, the first Heisman Trophy a wide receiver has won in a number of years. So you're telling me that all of a sudden the step from the SEC to the NFL is so big that being 166 pounds is going to be a crippling problem. I just don't see it. So at which point, go back to the tape, look at what he's been doing, and you're looking at one of the most sophisticated and complete wide receiver prospects that's come along in years, and I I don't think that'll change. It'll be the question there is, can Hurts get the ball to him? Um, yes, I'm, I'm sure you I'm sure you saw this, but and I don't like to put too much stock in in guys throwing picks in mini camps. But Tua threw five yesterday, and I was just looking at their roster. You know, you talk about teams with great receivers; they've got three legit receivers. Now, one's a rookie, Jalen Waddle, um, but they've got three really good ones: Parker, Fuller, Waddle. They've got a really good tight end in Kasicki. They've got Miles Gaskin. He's got weapons to throw to, but. Does PFF have serious question marks with Tua this year? I mean, I think everybody has serious question marks about Tua. The one thing I will say about the five picks in practice is, you know, I saw a clip of the weather down there in Miami, and it was a proper Florida rainstorm at the time. So I think you you would probably expect a bunch of picks in those kind of weather. Um, I think Brian Flores probably subscribes to that Bill Belichick approach of, We practice whatever the weather is, you know, and that way we're ready for it on game day when it comes, if it comes, whereas a lot of NFL coaches, you know, practice time is so small. uh, As soon as there's any kind of rain, you're retreating to the bubble, to the dome, uh, and you're not worrying about it because you don't want to risk the, you don't want to risk the five picks that don't really do anything for your practice time. But yeah, look, Tua is everything for Miami this year. They have a good team and a good roster top to bottom and they had multiple opportunities this offseason to get back in the quarterback market and to potentially upgrade over Tua, um, even if it would be harsh to, to sort of kick him to the curb a year into this thing, and not even a year because he didn't start the whole season. Um, but now that they've thrown their support behind him, he needs to pay it back. Like He needs to show a significant jump forward from what we saw a year ago. He was reasonably accurate as a rookie. He didn't make a lot of big plays at all. Um, those kind of deep downfield uh, attacking plays that were there at Alabama when everybody's five yards open at all times, they weren't there so far um, in his rookie season. He had a, a, the lowest big-time throw rate in the NFL last season. So, yeah, he needs to take a, a real step forward in that area. I think just being more aggressive and more comfortable and putting the ball down the field without turning it over. Sam, thanks as always for the time. We do appreciate it. Sam Monson, lead NFL analyst for PFF. You can follow him on Twitter at PFF underscore Sam. We'll talk to you again soon. Anytime, guys. Take it easy. Yep. Always has great skinny from Pro Football Focus. Those guys join us throughout the NFL season as we ramp up towards training camps, which will start next month. 